Hey everyone, welcome to the 232nd episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And we have an excellent show for you today. We are going to be talking about a new project that will tell you how secure your home devices are, a hack for the espressive chips that so many makers and even companies use, a new smart home controller, a new DIY voice assistant, some Apple news, a little bit of news on Amazon, Android, and August. How do you like that, you guys? And we have our guest this week. We're doing a twofer, Gaye Sokak and Pilgrim Beert. And they're going to be talking about building a minimum viable ecosystem for the Internet of Things. It is going to blow your minds, you guys. And we're also going to announce our IoT podcast listener hotline winner, plus hear from our sponsor of Faro. So, Buckle up! Let's kick this show off with a message from another one of our sponsors, Simple Commands. Wish that you could do more home automation routines with your smart home devices? Simple Commands is a cloud-based service that not only allows you to access all of your smart devices in one place, but also lets you use triggers and routines to customize and automate your smart home. Simple Commands enables you to arm and disarm a ring alarm, open and close garage doors, and have a Sonos device speak a voice notification such as someone is at the front door, or Nest camera sees a person in the backyard, etc. So sign up for an account online at www.simplecommands.com or download the app in the Google Play or Apple App Store. Alrighty, Kevin, let's kick it off with Secure devices. So a group of researchers from the Georgia Institute of Technology and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill have done a security assessment of a bunch of IoT devices. And they basically gave them scores that go on a scale of 100, 100 being really, really secure. So far, they've evaluated about 74 devices, but they're only showing about 45 rankings at a site called yourthings.edu. Info. I should have bought that domain name. Yeah. It's not smart things. It's your Your things. things. And there's some surprising things. Mm -hmm. They scored it on a couple different aspects. So the device itself, its app, its cloud, and the network. That's actually very comprehensive. And I was kind of surprised at some of the results. (laughs) Yes. Um, And to be clear, these are mostly, if not all, smart home type devices. So if you have those kind of things in your house, you definitely want to take a look at this. These are all mostly big name devices, right? Yeah. I mean, they've got the obviously Amazon Echo. They've got Wemo stuff. They've got Canary. They've got Chinese webcam. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) LifeX, Nest stuff, the Ring doorbell, Roku, smart things, TP-Link stuff. This This is is good. Really hefty. This is this this hits the bulk of the mainstream devices, I would say. Yeah, and the Philips Hue did pretty well on most aspects compared to some of the others. Yeah, not uh, so much in the app area, but that's that's okay. Yeah. That I could live with, right? Like I'm mostly concerned with how secure is the device, how secure is um, its network protocols, and does it use encryption? Does it store anything in plain text? And it did really well in all those things. It did. And you know what? I think you have one of these. One of the best performing devices out there was actually the Canary. That's why I bought it. No, I didn't. Is that why you bought it? It is, because I knew that yourthings.info was going to rank this sucker high. The device itself got a a 93. The mobile score is 100. The Mm -hmm. cloud score was an 83.7. And the network score was 100. Right. Wow. Go Canary. So the nice thing is, like, if you want to see the actual details of those scores, like the Canary scores that you just mentioned, if you go onto the website and click the name of the device, you can actually see a breakdown of why it got a cloud score of 83, whereas everything else, its other scores were 92, 100, et cetera. 
and they list all the properties that are part of their their rubric for grading. So does it have uh, hybrid endpoints, first party endpoints, third party endpoints? Are the certificates self-signed? What is the TLS configuration in the cloud? Yeah. There's a ton. And, and I looked at the network score just because it scored 100 just to see what they're looking for and all the things that I would expect them to be, you know, um, HTTP instead of HTTPS, uh, UPnP support, encryption from mobile to device, device to cloud, etc. So there's a lot of detailed information if you want to drill down into your devices. And if you have a lot of these devices, I think it's your duty. I know it's not yeah. any fun, you guys, but I think it's your job. You should go and look at this so you have an understanding for two reasons. One, because this is your network, but two, then you can be a better advocate for everybody else who's not going to go look at this. And you can demand this from the companies that make your products. Be so. part of the resistance. Join us at yourthings.info. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. But I would also add one more thing to this. Any device you're considering to buy an ad before you even do it, go see if it's here and check it out. Yes. Yes. All right. We're going to put that in the show notes. Check it out. I think I might write a little thing about it just because it's that good. Because it's that awesome. All right. So moving right along, we have this is not rated on the Ear Things device because it is brand new. But Eslo Innovations has launched the smallest smart home hub on the market. I am not measuring these things, but it is certainly a cheap smart home hub. This is a $29.95 little box that only has Z-Wave and Wi-Fi, I should say. Now, you may have remembered, because a couple weeks ago, we talked about Eslo Innovations. They were the company that has bought two things that we have talked about in the past. One, the Vera system, that was a Z-Wave system, the bankrupt Centralite systems. It's also actually brought Fortress, which made a bunch of IP cameras. So you can buy this online and control basically Z-Wave and Wi-Fi stuff. Yeah. And it's going to use the Vera mobile app. So if you are a Vera user, you're going to feel really at home here. Yes. Um, there are a lot of supported apps listed here. The one constraint is exactly what you just mentioned. Uh, you'll be using the Vera app and or another constraint is the lack of Bluetooth which shocks me, but it is what it is. It's only 30 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's a little, <laughs> it's basically a little USB stick that you, you, you plug in. Yeah. So for anyone out there, I, and I know there are a lot of you, want to play around with the new smart home hub if you've got Z-Wave, or maybe you don't have any Z-Wave stuff, but you want to try it out. This yeah. is probably a really easy way to try out Z-Wave. Definitely. With Z-Wave, you get this whole world of sensors. So pretty cool. Absolutely. I, guess, I don't know, Kevin, should we get one? We should get one. All right. We'll, we should, we'll, you know what? Take two. They're small. <laughs> All righty. Bone up on my Z-Wave stuff. Okay. Speaking of new, fun, crazy projects, <laughs> which I guess it's not a crazy project, the Eslo thing, but I'm thinking of it as one. There is an onboard voice assistant that can run on a $5 pie. Kevin, tell us about this thing. It's crazy. Yes, this is crazy. So this is from Pico Voice, which is a Canadian company, and they wanted to create a voice assistant system that runs locally. So no sending information to the cloud. All of the voice commands and language processing happens on device. And what they've done is they have done this in stages. They have something called Porcupine, which is their code for, for wake word detection. Rhino is their little code project to handle speech to intent. And now they've got Cheetah, which is the code for speech to text translation. So you put all these together yourself. I hate to say, well, I love to say, cause I will do this. Um, <laughs> I would hate to say it. <laughs> you would hate to say it, but I think you should do this. Um, you can go right onto GitHub, which is where a lot of people store their code for availability for others to work on, collaborate with, et cetera. You can download this and you can run this literally on a $5 Raspberry Pi Zero. Doesn't require a ton of processing power or a lot of upfront expense. You'll need to put it together yourself. But again, I like to do these things. So I, I've got a couple of pies sitting here. I even have an Arduino and I don't know if it will run on that, but there's a lot of things this could run on. So I'm going to play with this. I just love the fact that it's local on device. It's free for non-commercial use. Anybody wants to 
commercialize this, you're going to have to pay for a license. All right. You know what, Kevin? You're hmm. inspiring me. My daughter went back to school. I've got lots of time. <gasps> yes. I'm doing it. I'm doing it, but I'm Yay. calling you for help. GitHub. Right. Get a GitHub account right now. Uh, well, we're All doing right, the show right now. Right now. Yeah, okay. All I'm, right. I'm going to wait till after the show. All right. In the meantime, we're going to talk about some gossipy news. I don't know. What would we call this? Gossip? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> anything anything about the next company we talk about is pretty much gossip and rumors until the company announces something. So we're talking about Apple, and they apparently may possibly have VR headset plans, according to Mac rumors. They have cited documentation in an internal build of iOS 13 that says that Apple is continuing to build a head-mounted augmented reality display. Is this good? I'm kind of curious about this, mostly because most augmented reality displays out there are for industrial use. They're very expensive. I tried some on the other just a couple weeks ago at Microsoft. And I don't know, Kevin, this this yeah. could bring it to everybody. I mean, AR kit was kind of neat for that purpose, but... Right. What Apple typically does is go down to the lowest common denominator for a product so that the widest audience possible can actually get some value from the product. So I'm curious, will this eventually find its way into enterprises and industrial and so on. We don't know, obviously. I don't I'm, think so. Maybe it finds it. Maybe in like four years, we're actually going to have a tenable head mounted display. Cause think about the, in talking to the folks at Microsoft about their development of products for the HoloLens, they had to build some of their own components. But once that was done, and if this, if that gains a market, then mm -hmm. we could actually see this be commodified down to normal people level. Possibly. I don't know. You never know with Apple. You never know. What we do know based on the actual iOS 13 files, the system is called Starboard and the device is codenamed Garta. So we'll see Garta. if we hear any more about those. And also, the we're, and we're actually going to talk about this next, but Apple's Find My app, which let me, let me say that again, Find My space app. So it used to be find my <laughs> iPhone. Yeah, it's not find my app. It's the find, find my, my app, which they're modifying for iOS 13. Apparently, there is an icon in there that looks to be like a AR or VR headset as well. So this looks pretty credible. But again, it's gossip and rumor until Apple decides to say we have a product and here it is. Exactly. Because they, they pull things at the last minute all the time. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about the find my Thing, computer, <laughs> phone, AR headset, question mark. They had announced that you could now find your MacBook with the internet turned off, basically using the Bluetooth and any nearby Apple devices. It's essentially how a Tile device and other Bluetooth-based trackers work. I'm saying essentially because there's all sorts of weird things that Apple has done to make it more secure. We're not going to get into that, but... What they're seeing is that there could be a tag-like device coming. It depicts the tag as a circle with a little Apple logo on it. It could be a placeholder. We have to say that here. Who knows? But it looks like you could tag stuff. It looks like a tile. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know how else to say it. It right. looks like a tile. Right. And Apple's key... implementation of a, of a tile. And, and we had heard rumor about this probably four or five months ago. And thinking yes. maybe at WWDC it would be announced, it wasn't. But again, iOS 13 builds are showing these icons and such. And iOS 13 is likely going to be announced next week. So, Yeah, next week at the big Apple event on Tuesday. Don't worry. We're going to tell you all our thoughts after the fact. So we'll see what comes out of this. So next up is, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a day that ends in Y. We have an attack. All right, the Espressive SP chips, the ESP32, and I always get this all wrong. 8266, maybe? 8266. I was like, 8260, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, these two chips have been hacked, sort of. But Espressive has already issued a fix. So let's tell you a little bit about what's happening here. This is a proof of concept for some Wi-Fi vulnerabilities. And basically, there are three different vulnerabilities. The most notable one is on the ESP32 or the SP32. This can bypass the secure boot 
at startup and then boot unverified code from your flash, which basically that, that's actually a very common type of attack. But you can protect against it. If you set up your device apparently appropriately the first time or to be secure, you actually just enable flash encryption. And you could have done that early. If you haven't done that to fix it, you actually have to go and update the firmware. And just to be clear, these chips are available as, say, um, DIY or maker type uh, products to add to a Pi or an Arduino to add Wi-Fi, basically. So it's not like there are a massive amount of consumer products with these chips in there. If there were, that would be a bigger issue, obviously. However, your Kickstarter stuff could be... Okay. I'm like, these are super popular. Yeah. Just in fact, just before the show, we were doing some research on this. I, I was looking up uh, Arduino stuff because I'm using Arduino in my comp site class and bought an, a new Arduino this weekend. One of the most commonly bought Wi-Fi boards for the Arduino uses the ESP32. Yes. And actually, I should tell you guys, not <laughs> if you're worried about this or you were looking at ESP Espressive chips, they did just launch the ESP32-S2, which has more security features. So Hence the S. Maybe you should you should buy that going forward. But remember, and this is actually something I hear from a lot of chip vendors, they put these features on the chip and in their firmware, but a lot of people, when they build out the device, they don't enable it. And there are efforts, ARM has made a big effort to try to make it much easier to kind of turn on the security features that are on chips. And hopefully we'll start seeing the benefits of that. But a lot of times people just, they're like, I bought a secure chip and they stick it in there and they don't realize that they have to do something. You have to enable these things if you're, again, if a maker or DIY person. And quite frankly, this kind of gets back to something I've been harping on for years uh, related to like uh, trusted platform modules, saying every IoT device should have one. Every IoT device should have secure boot as well, in my opinion. Yes. I'm going to hammer home my favorite analogy on this. It's like setting up a password on your Wi-Fi network and then giving it out to everybody instead of using the guest network. Yeah. All right. Let's hit the news, Kevin. All right. Yeah. Starting with the Galaxy Home, the Bixby speaker that I still think looks like a fondue pot. Samsung still has not released this device. They announced it last summer. It's been coming, coming, coming soon, and it's still not here yet. However, there's a small version, the Galaxy Home Mini, that is actually in live beta in South Korea, which is where Samsung is based. So there is a real product and it's being tested now. It's just smaller. So maybe at IFA show this week, Samsung will announce availability. I do not know, but it lives. It lives. Also at IFA this week, August has announced that Yale, which purchased August, has announced that they are bringing the August app to Europe inside Yale Locks. Basically, what happened is Yale, or rather Asa Abloy, the company that owns Yale, they bought August to put its software in its locks, which is fine. And yeah. these locks are going to be GDPR compliant. Maybe we'll get some of that over in the US coming soon, but we'll see. Anyway, the point is, news at IFA. August is going to Europe. Yeah. And if I go shopping at Whole Foods, I may go without my wallet and my phone because apparently Amazon is testing a payment system codenamed Orville, and it will scan your hand to ring up the purchase. Kind of like the retina scanning of Face ID and other similar biometric things. I don't know if I like this, but it would kind of be cool to just put my hand over a scanner. I obviously would have had to previously scan it to set up my account, but over, go to Whole Foods or maybe Amazon Go and just pass your hand as you walk out over the turnstile and you're paid. Ta-da! Scary. Although I can totally see if someone like hacked your account, then when you walked over, maybe you bought their filet mignon and you're like, you hmm. get home and you're like, ah, I did not buy that. Well, don't shake hands with anybody after that. No, no. Mm. I think the app would be the weak link there, not the biometric data. Probably but, correct. Yeah. So very cool. In other 
It's not really biometric, but it is kind of to do with wearables. So we'll call it that. (laughs) I'm making a segue (laughs) up out of thin air. But Android 10 allows your hearing aids to turn into Bluetooth headsets, which is pretty freaking cool. There is a new protocol called Audio Streaming for Hearing Aids, ASHA, and this allows people to use their Pixel phones to stream to certain hearing aids. These are the Resound Lynx Quattro and Belltone Amaze hearing aids, as well as the Cochlear Nucleus 7 sound processor. So this is not everywhere. It's only on your Pixel phones. But with this sort of open code, you could see, obviously, more phones, more hearing aids. Yeah. And this would be awesome. You would still have your hearing aid. But instead of today, if you want to actually talk on the phone with your hearing aid, you have to have an app on your phone and you have to set things up. And I think you manually have, I know my mom has them and she has to manually trigger that. This sounds like it would just happen, which is kind of cool. It is. And I'm wondering if the protocol requires specific Bluetooth chips because that would explain why it's limited so far, because this is Google's open sourcing this platform, which means anybody will be able to use it. So if you have an older hearing aid that has Bluetooth, maybe, you know, it's not going to work with that one, but maybe your next one, I don't know. The streaming is done over Bluetooth low energy, which is awesome for battery life. I'm thinking even further down the line, could then your hearing aid be used to say, okay, G, what's the weather outside? And so on. I would be a cyborg. Mm Mm-hmm. Can't wait. All right. One other little news bit in the continuation of reporting on ring doorbells and police departments around the country, CNET is pointing out that if you share your ring video footage with the police, they can actually keep it for as long as they want, and they can share it with other law enforcement agencies. So you have lost control of that once you give them that information. Right. And- This, again, I don't know if this is nefarious. I do know that we have to be asking a lot more questions when we build this stuff. Like, I don't feel like the ring people are like, yes, I want to build a surveillance state. I really believe they're like, yes, I want to make neighborhoods safer. I don't, you know. But I do think that every company putting this sort of devices out that collect this kind of data that could be highly personal and is not permission-based is really, it's incumbent upon them to think things through. And I'm thinking about what if someone in a neighborhood full of immigrants puts this in and Mm -hmm. police get some of this data from them and they see that there are people that could be deported and they send that over to ICE. Right. Nobody wants to be part of that. Maybe you want to help solve a crime, but you don't want to catch innocent passers by. And yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I I agree with you. I don't think there's anything with. I think they have good intentions here, but any company that's trying to do anything like this, they need to be more transparent than, in my opinion, Ring and Amazon have been. Yes, and also apparently Ring is like we don't do facial recognition, but. It has been pointed out that they do have someone who is researching facial recognition. So they may not do it today, but maybe they're going to do it tomorrow. And will they tell us? I hope so. And if they do add that feature, A, will they tell us? Or B, will they then let you opt out and delete all of the prior information that you've given? Ah! I doubt it, quite honestly. But Come on, Ring. Do the right thing. Yep. Okay. Ten times. Very nice. I know, right? That's, that's yeah. unfortunate for them, I guess. <laughs> All right. I believe it is time for our favorite part of the show. Is this our favorite part of the show, Kevin? I like it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We're like, we're we're about to give something away to someone for free. Oh, yes. Then it is my favorite. I love giving people presents. I also like receiving them. Okay. It is time for the IoT Podcast Hotline, which this week is brought to you by Schlage. Schlage's wide variety of smart locks lets you create the smart home of your dreams. Learn more about Schlage's smart home solutions and compatibility with Amazon and Apple products. All of this and more at schlage.com slash IOT. Okay. First off, let's announce our winner. Yeah. Ed, who 
had the question, actually, I think it was last week about the smart water spigot. So Ed, you are our winner of the Ecobee smart switch that has integrated Madam A. We'll reach out to you. Can I just say, we put all of these voicemail calls in a spreadsheet. And when it's time to pick a winner, I actually ask my Google Home to pick a random number from one to however many calls we have. And somehow it seems to always pick a, a previous caller. Like even though there are a lot of, a lot of calls that we didn't get to answer yet, it just seems to pick one that we have. So, so it's yes, weird. now, you, now you know now our you magical know. process, which is yes. very Google based. Yes. So, mm. Mm. okay. Before we tackle this week, let's tell you guys how you can call us, get your question in to win this month's prize, which is ba 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 a Schlag Lock. That's right. It is a Zigbee or Z Wave based Schlag Lock. It's very nice. Okay, so to enter to win, you have to call us and leave us a voicemail at 512 623 7424. It's very easy. Just call, leave the message, and voila! We will only ship these locks, by the way, to the U.S. and Canada. I'm sorry, the rest of the world. Now, it is time to hear this week's question, which is from Richard. Hi, my name is Richard, and I am wondering if there's a way to electronically tag tools as from time to time I borrow tools out to people, forget who has them, and as well, if there's a way to electronically tag them, so I know who has them. Oh, Richard. <laughs> can I borrow a hammer, Richard? I'm like, can I borrow it like a circular saw or something really expensive? <laughs> kidding, I'm uh, kidding. <laughs> so we have a wide range of solutions. And some of them are a little bit more practical than others. Some of them are going to cost you a lot of money. We're just going to non-judgmentally throw all of these out and you can pick. And if you want to call us back and let us know what the heck you chose, that'd be awesome because yeah. I'm curious. All right. First up, make a list. <laughs> Paper and pencil. I know. It's, you know, maybe it's so there's a not whiteboard IRT. by your, you know, those little magnet boards. You could stick it on your, your, yeah. by your thing and just be like, I want my saw to bill. Okay. I'm guessing because you listen to our show, you don't want to do that because that is very low tech. And that's so, okay. And that's fine. We came up with a crazy tech nutty idea, which is you stick NFC tags on all of your tools that you lend out and you scan those tags. Before you put the tool in there, you say, this is a hammer and I'm lending it to Bill. You would scan it, program it, and then send it back. And then Bill would have to scan it on his end and be like, oh, actually, this doesn't work. We just no, realized no. that. No, no. Only Richard has to scan it. He, yeah, but how's he going to find out? He doesn't have the tag anymore to scan it when he gets back. Or like if it's lent out to somebody. He'll know who. Oh, because it's in the app. Yeah. yeah. All right. Kevin Start is whispering way. like, we're going to take this out, but we're not going to take this out because this is my process. <laughs> okay. This is this is Stacy going, wait a second. This we is too worked much hard on this. We can't ignore it. <laughs> It made sense when we talked about it earlier. Okay. So you can buy some of these tags. Let's see. We found some for what? We found eight oh, for- 10 of them for like 12 bucks on Amazon. And basically, yeah, you're going to scan the tag or program it with the person's name and maybe their phone number. Um, and then that way, you know, that person has that tag, which is tied to a certain tool. And in your app on your phone, after you scan it, you're going to have a list after you've scanned a whole bunch of these. And that way, you know, who's got what and- you if can they call scan them. it with their phone, they'll know that that belongs to you. If you program it that way, yes. <laughs> oh, that's right. Look, see, I'm lost again. That's okay. Right. Let's not overcomplicate this. <laughs> Richard just <laughs> needs to keep track of who has what tool. <laughs> right, right. All right, Richard. Um, I'm telling you, this list is a great idea. But <laughs> let's say you have a lot more. Let's say <laughs> this NFC thing is too confusing, which for me it is. But you have some money. Not a lot of money, but enough money. You could buy a Bluetooth tracker. I'm going to recommend a tile mm -hmm. um, until Apple throws out their tracker, which I assume would work with other things. For the moment, uh, the tile would work. So there is a variety of tiles. You could buy the original Tile Mate, which doesn't have a rechargeable battery. Um, for 25 bucks. 
You could buy the Tile Slim for 30 bucks, or you could buy the Mate Pro, which has a removable battery that you can update after a year. Otherwise, they go dead after a year. And that's about 35 bucks. Uh, the more you buy, the more you save on the tiles. And what you would have to do for this ideally to work, there's a couple ways. You would stick the tile on whatever it is you're loaning out. Then you would ideally, because this is a friend, ask them to download the tile app on their phone as part of the like, hey, if you want to borrow my tool, you have to use this. And why would they need the app? I know the answer, but... They need the app because they have to have someone nearby running tile for the most accurate location. Location. Thank you. I was like, yeah, whatever. Or if you don't want to force people to do that, you can to download the tile app. You could also like hang out at their house and check like to see if your tile is fine. Oh, no, because it'd be on your phone. Nope. Nope. Look at me. I'm making things way complicated. I know. Just do that. Paper and Just pencil. Just do that. Paper this, and this, pencil. <laughs> this weekend, really complicated stuff. So <laughs> pop a tile on your thing. There's stickers. There's rubber bands. There's all kinds of ways to get it on there. And I'm assuming you trust these people. If you don't trust these people, we recommend going, we'll call it the nuclear option, which is a GPS 3G-based tracker from like a Verizon or AT&T. That's for if you think someone's going to take your hammer and run off to the next yeah. state. You'll know where it is. The only downside, and again, hopefully these are your friends and they would not do this. It would be very easy for someone to just rip the tile tracker or the GPS tracker off and dump it in a lake somewhere and keep your tool and that'd be that. I would assume your friends wouldn't do that. Yeah. So again, I feel like a list is a really good option for you, but <laughs> for dealing with friends. Yeah. You know, you could buy the tile, the pro, the super major pro one. You can buy four of them for like 25 bucks a piece, pop them on your most expensive tools. And if it were me, and I don't think the NFC bit is as complicated as we might have made it sound. And I would <laughs> anyway, basically, I would just spend, you know, the 12 bucks for a couple of these NFC stickers and program them to keep track of who's got what. And that would be it. If you need the location of where they are, then yeah, you got to go with a Bluetooth tile or a GPS tracker. But I don't think it's location that you really need. Again, assuming these are your friends, I'd go with the NFC. All right. Kevin's voting for NFC. I'm voting for a $5 magnet board that you keep people on a list for. It's up to you. So it is up to you. Or if you want to get crazy, go get crazy. Thank you for the question, Richard. Yeah. All right. Now it is time for a message from our sponsor. But before we do that, please stay tuned for our guests this week, who are Gaye Soka and Pilgrim Beert, who are going to be talking about building a minimum viable ecosystem for IoT, not just products, but also services. It is a fascinating interview. So stay tuned for that. Hey everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Afero, and I have Joe Britt, the CEO of Afero, here to talk to us. Joe, it's great to have you back. And as usual, I'm going to ask you quickly to describe Afero. Thanks, Stacy. It's always good to be here. Afero provides an IoT platform that really simplifies how you connect anything to the internet. And we can help you build a business case as well and take you all the way through rollout, ongoing management, and data analytics. Afero also happens to have the fifth largest patent portfolio in IoT globally, and especially around things like security, onboarding, provisioning, and device management. Our customers tell us that Afero is the best choice for end user experience and developer productivity. And it's also beautifully designed, easy to use, fast, and very, very secure. All right. And so last time we talked about companies building multiple IoT devices and device types and the growing need for consistency. I would like to focus on how that process can be simplified. Right. Well, the challenges really start as you add more and so then as you scale. And that growth and scaling can happen along multiple dimensions. Your number of users, your supported geographies, your number of device types, etc. More specifically, when you have a lot of users, you need a back end that can handle those users at scale and at speed. If you roll out to new geographies, you need infrastructure that covers those geographies. Then, when you add new kinds of devices or even new generations of old products, you want to leverage as much as possible what you've done before. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. 
That makes sense. So how do you go about tackling those challenges? It's important that the IoT backend is designed to scale elastically and to be highly resilient. That's what allows you to scale to millions of users and still maintain really fast response times and avoid outages. On the device side, the name of that game is reuse. As an example, if you've already built a connected light or a connected motor, you should be able to reuse those designs in any device that uses a light or a motor. You kind of create these Lego-like pieces that let you mix and match and build more sophisticated devices. And if you're building a second generation product, you only need to update the pieces that have changed. A real world case study for this is Kenmore, because this is exactly how Kenmore was able to introduce over 40 Afero connected appliances in less than two years. I like that analogy. Thank you, Joe. But before we go, please remind us where people can go to to get more information about Afero. Absolutely. Afero.io slash go dash big is the best place to start. If you're a developer, also please see developer.afero.io. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guests are two. That's right. For the first time ever, we have two guests. We have Gaye Soikak, who is head of emerging technology at Legal in General, a financial firm. And we have Pilgrim Beert, who is the CEO of Device Pilot. We're going to be talking about the concept of a minimum viable ecosystem for IoT. And first off, Gaye, hey, thanks for coming on the show this week. Hi, Stacey. Pleasure. And Pilgrim, we have spoken several times before in many iterations of yours, but also thank you for coming on the show this week. It's lovely to be talking to you again, Stacey. Excellent. So, Gaye, you actually came up with this concept of the minimum viable ecosystem for IoT as part of your job at Legal in General. Can you talk about how it came about and what it is? Sure. So, I have worked with like several complex ecosystems for for some time, including data ecosystems and more and more in the upcoming years, working more on platforms, network systems, as well as distributed ones, such as blockchain. And I find myself not being able to define, articulate where should we start for adoption, where the growth will be. So I had to find this term to be able to say to my colleagues, to the other people that I'm working with, this is our minimum viable ecosystem, where we start with. What I meant with that was this group of entities that are going to work together to ensure growth and adoption, to be able to test an idea. But also it meant if there was one more entity from the minimum viable ecosystem, it would be redundant. Like consortiums have a lot of those that you don't, you might not necessarily need at scale when you're just starting. Or if there was like one less entity, it would mean that we wouldn't be able to sufficiently test the idea or ensure growth after it is verified. So it was like a practical term that I had to use to articulate where we start for adoption. Okay. And can you maybe give me an example from your industry of what it would look like? Sure. The recent one uh, that I'm working on is digital identity. Digital identity is this thing where each thing, person, or an organization has a digital cryptographic identity that they could, A, identify themselves, um, but also like eliminate fraud, security, yada, yada. And digital identity has an impact in several different industries. So there are like 100 ways to start this. I really believe it's, it has a lot of impact in several ways. So I had to define my minimum viable ecosystem if in legal in general, we are going to adopt digital identity. My company has already like several different businesses within uh, several different financial uh, businesses. So there's already an ecosystem that I could start with. But I also want it to be shareable, like shared identities in the sense that like once you have, once a person, for example, has an identity, it's not only in one company, but they could use it in several different other companies. So what I had to put into my ecosystem to test the shareability is another financial entity like a bank. So my minimum viable ecosystem had to have a bank to test the shareability. 
Got it. All right. In Pilgrim, hearing about this, you have been in the Internet of Things industry for a really long time, even before we were all excited about it. You were the founder of Alert Me, which has built platforms for IoT businesses for a while, since I think 2006. Was that it? Yeah. Okay. So a long time. And when you heard about this, what struck you as important about this concept? Well, well, it even goes back earlier than 2006. I suppose I've been involved in innovation my whole career, and I'm I'm 50 something now, so that's been quite a long time. And I've I've seen several sort of new technologies come up from nothing and then become uh, widespread phenomena. And I sort of noticed that you get this sort of phase change that happens in the middle of that process. So at the beginning, the the very early players, the early companies that are trying to bring these new new ideas to market, it's a real struggle because there aren't any pieces for them to use. They have to build everything themselves is extremely painful and slow and expensive. And often, you know, when they finally launch a thing onto the market, no one understands what it is. And it perhaps it doesn't even work very well because it's been so hard to make everything, to sort of lash everything together. And that's a picture that might be familiar to people in the IoT world. But then this sort of sudden shift happens in the market to do with openness, because as more and more players come into the market, to begin with, each of them is building their own complete solution and starting to compete with all the other complete solutions. But that's actually incredibly incredibly inefficient. And you, and you quickly end up with a situation where everyone's trying to do everything and, and therefore being bad at everything. So the, the whole system kind of shifts quite rapidly, usually in, in just a few years, to a true ecosystem where each player starts to focus on doing one thing really well and leave all the other pieces of the puzzle to other people. So for example, at Alert Me, my previous company, it was a smart home platform. To begin with, we had to do hardware uh, development, software development, build the services that went on top. We had, we had to do the whole thing. But then as the ecosystem started to evolve, we could, for example, buy third-party devices and put them on our platform and integrate perhaps with third-party applications that could take the data and do other things with it. The, the sort of emergence of that ecosystem is a fundamental requirement with any new technology, and it can be it can be painful. And therefore, the idea of the minimum viable ecosystem, which is how you get that transition started, how many players have to work together to actually begin that transition, is a really, really interesting idea to me. Agree. I love this idea of being able to shave off time and waste in the industry. And especially when we think about consumers and businesses who are trying to adopt this, it would be handy for them too, because they don't have to come back two years later and say, oh, these guys have gotten out of this segment of the business, this has failed, etc. So it feels like a very powerful idea which means I want to know how we build one. We'll start with just the steps. So I feel like you probably need to identify your needs, but Gaye, you want to take this? Sure. I think you're spot on. You have to identify your needs or your objective. Because when I'm approaching this, I have used it for different contexts as well. And I'm trying to kind of use the term as a framework instead of like making it detailed. So it's how you would use and build your minimum viable ecosystem will depend on the objective that you have. The other is like the business case. So the, one of the things that I'm looking at, because it's a proposition, this minimum viable ecosystem has to make sure by itself, even if it doesn't grow, it's viable enough for the business to continue looking after it. So for the proposition, I have to make sure like, does it stack up as well, the business proposition, even if it doesn't grow. There is like um, the proposition itself, but there is the building part of it as well, the backstage. I'll give an example from how I adopted minimum viable ecosystem to build a product, a proposition. And then I had to look at the builders, like who I need, who are, what's the capability that I need in which organizations. And at the point I look at, and there was like six external organizations that I'm working with, as well as six internal entities that I needed in different stages of the adoption, but everyone was there in the table, including my regulation, including my security, including my um, digital team, as well as external companies that I'm working with. Got it. Okay. So it sounds like in this framework, you're identifying your business case or what you're trying to do, which I kind of skipped right over, the needs that you have and the players that are going to provide those needs, be the regulatory, maybe it's hardware, maybe it's internal, external. What was really important is this idea of shareability. So if it's something that needs to be shared, how do you build? I'm assuming it's both a technical and a logistical framework for sharing 
maybe it's data, maybe it's revenue, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's in your case of identity, it's, I guess, everything associated with that identity. And then also this idea of building a solid enough business case that you can protect it, even if it doesn't grow for a while or grow like you expected it. Does that sound fair? I think it's perfect. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, and this is for either of you, when you get started with this and you've built this, what is the next step? Usually in manufacturing, if you're building a minimum viable product, you throw it out into the world and test it. I'm curious what you do in this case. My reaction would be to absolutely agree with that. I think it would be tempting to think of a minimum viable ecosystem as just being all the vendors that need to get together to make a complete solution. But as you've already said, the customer is an absolutely vital part of the minimum viable ecosystem, not just because they'll be paying for it, but because they are the proof of the pudding. You know, they're the actual use case that you're testing against. And I think typically it will be an iteration. You know, you won't have got things right all the way across the ecosystem and it joins between the pieces. And the only way to shake that all out is to actually start doing it and seeing what's wrong and and fixing stuff. So this is not a hypothetical exercise. It, It has to be done. I often say that the value of early customers is not what they pay you, it's what they teach you. And I think that's so true with the minimum viable ecosystem. It's that it's the learning that makes each part better, but also makes the whole better. All right. So you have this organism that you're trying to protect. You're trying to grow and nurture into the world. How do you communicate with your participants in the ecosystem? One of the challenges here is everyone should be about on the same page. And I think that's really hard because different entities are going to have different business goals. How do you align those? How do you get people on board? How do you find partners who are willing to participate in something like this? Because I think this is the way the economy is going and business development is going, but it's also a very new route. Yes. So how do you find partners who are willing to think that far ahead? First of all, like I totally agree with the living organism part. Um, And I, when I'm explaining to other people, I use the images of terrariums. You know, like terrariums is this thing where you put the ingredients first and maybe you care at first, but then they just live by themselves. So the minimum viable ecosystem as well, like at first, when you're building it, it might look like as any controlled, structured business as usual adoption. But the the rule that I've put on the minimum viable ecosystem, once you're successful, you don't need a product manager as a minimum viable product. You don't need an ecosystem manager. It should be like growing by itself because the idea is all the participants in that terrarium, in that in that structure, has to have their goals and needs met, including the user, your partners, your internal uh, organization. And I can give an example. So this was last year. I need a blockchain pilot uh, that was for an adoption for within our company. So the platform, it was it was the first three months, and it's a very new uh, concept for the business, but also for the products as well. It's like one or two years, like the the solutions exist on it. So internally, we didn't necessarily have the capability of several different things, including legal and contracts for this. At a point, there were six external entities and six internal entities where you're looking at like a three months, very simple pilot project. And there is like almost 12 different entities with different demands and needs. And I didn't even put the customer that should be more than 12. What happened is that when I'm choosing, the, especially the external entities, when I'm choosing those people, I look at some factors that really help us stick together. First of all, like everyone has a business situation. Some are kind of in the supplier situation. Some are in the partnership, in revenue share model. And some are just like um, consultancy one-off. Um, so everyone is like getting what they are putting as an effort and they are getting it. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. The other parameter was the speed. When you're building this fast, like if there's so many moving parties, you have to make sure all of them kind of uh, goes in the same speed which is not a problem when you have an internal team because they will have a process that they follow and it's a similar timeline. But when it's like disparate pieces, you just have to make sure the, the speed of 
the entities are almost matching. Like if there is one very slow, that will follow. And what I wanted to make sure, because we are a financial institution, like most of them are faster than me, because I would be the slowest, uh, definitely, in, because of the regulation and whatever I need to do within this large organization. And the third is like, okay, I don't necessarily believe in this fully, in the same that everyone should have a culture fit, but there is cultures that fit together. So when we are working together, like we have a similar language, like even if it's like seven different organizations working together, it was almost like it seemed like a team that works together. So there are some parameters, speed, cultures, and that every participant in that terrarium have their needs met. Awesome. And I hadn't thought about speed, but I guarantee you midway through that process, I would be like, oh, speed, so important. So good call there. And Pilgrim, do you have anything to add on this, especially the idea of getting people on the same page when it comes to value creation and being rewarded for that value creation? I think, again, it comes down to the customer because ultimately every party in the ecosystem needs to fully understand why they're doing it and be able to justify to all their colleagues why they're spending the resources on doing this thing instead of doing something else. And if you've got a significant customer or set of customers who say, if you build it, we will come, that creates the justification that then helps everyone else understand you know, why they're doing it and what the money is at the end of the rainbow, as it were. So that's, that's why it's so helpful. And also can, you know, can help to, to sort of judge whether the thing is good enough yet. But I think one thing I was just thinking about as Gaia was talking is something we often wrestle with a little bit at Device Pilot. We provide a sort of streaming analytics technology for IoT companies. And we're a horizontal technology, so we can be used by companies of all sorts and all sizes. But there's often a, a bit of tension between sort of one big customer versus lots of little customers. And I think that can be the case with the minimum viable ecosystem because, as Gaia said, uh, I think at the beginning of her introduction of it, you, you want to prove that it's going to work more than once, that it's going to work for more than one customer. And, and certainly we, we often find a lot of tension, given that time and money is finite, between going deep enough with large customers to really prove that we can solve the problem all the way to the bottom versus the danger that if you do that too much, too deeply with just one customer, then you'll become an outsourced development house for that customer and you'll never get any, any replicability. The answer to that is obviously you have lots of customers, but if you have too many light customers, you may never get deep enough to deliver any true and lasting value to any of them. So it's not really a partnership. It's just a you know one night stand or whatever. So I think there's an interesting tension there between depth and breadth when it comes to customer engagement for the minimum viable ecosystem. All right. And as my final question, and as a consumer who's always thinking about ecosystems, like there are plenty of ecosystems created in just the internet at large. And as a consumer, I'm moving between them. Sometimes I can't share data from one to the other. Sometimes there's inconveniences associated with that. So it's not as portable and shareable. I know when we started talking about creating the minimum viable ecosystem, we talked about not having a lot of members doing the same thing like a consortium might. But I feel like at the end of the day, we probably want to start bringing some similar people into our ecosystem or similar players into our ecosystem. So I'm curious about your take on as this matures, how do we bring in everybody else to the ecosystem? Or maybe we don't. Yeah, this word coopetition that I sometimes use which is a horrible word, but it's this idea that your competitors can actually be your collaborators to some extent, because in an early market, all the players have a similar problem, which is trying to access customers, trying to get customers to understand that what they have is valuable and can be bought and has a name and a set of features that they might want. And that's a really tough problem. And if you can go at it with several other people as well, then you'll get market adoption more quickly. So the moment where you start to find more and more competitors doing something similar to you is actually quite a good sign, usually, that there is actually an ecosystem starting to emerge that's worth other people serving as well. And that will just make the market grow faster for everyone. 
I think there's like two really important things that you mentioned. One is, do we push it for growth? And my take is like, if it's successful and if the people who are using it, getting the benefit, it will grow from the user perspective as well as like whatever type of entities that you have, whether it's your competition, whether it's like for me, for example, service companies. So if my, for example, digital identity is successful, people are happy to use it, like other finance companies can adopt it. It grows if it's successful, naturally, is my kind of idealistic push on this. The other thing is like, but it's also happening is like ecosystems sometimes form in parallel. So it might be equally possible that I grow a healthy ecosystem with my digital identity, but the same happens somewhere else. Then we are also looking at like inter-ecosystem exchange. Like it's very much in blockchain where like, it's almost like we're all everywhere in academia, everyone is working on it because they are like solutions by themselves. But if you kind of, the idea is that you're not trapped in one ecosystem, but you can move freely, whatever those services are. So the other approach is like inter-ecosystem sharing. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys, I feel a lot smarter. I feel like I understand what we're trying to do here and the benefits of doing it. So thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure, Stacey, and great to hear from Pilgrim as well. Thanks, Stacey. Really enjoyed it. Great talking to both of you. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. 